I thought I'd talk to you about another cool fossil, this time of a 30 million year old whale and its spectacular teeth. But I also want to make a bigger point about the concept of transitional fossils. Transitional fossils are a major bugaboo for creationists. They claim there aren't any, so they have to deny their existence, despite the fact that they're all over the fossil record. Part of that denial involves misunderstanding the term. Specifically, they imagine that evolution is a linear process with a species as a unitary construct that moves from form A to form B to form C, and so on, so that they can claim that we've failed to find form B if it is not a perfect intermediate in all the features simultaneously between A and C. This is not how evolution works. A successful form spawns many variants. It branches and explores morphospace with varying individuals and populations with varying success, such that some die out quickly, some may form short life species or populations that persist for a while, while some few may be successful for millions of years. Complicating it all is that some populations may independently explore and expand on different adaptations, and then blend, blend back together in a splendid orgy of recombination that combines traits and may even generate new emergent novelties. The bottom line is that it's not linear at all. And we make a terrible error when we take the scattered, sparse individuals in the fossil record and try to assemble a simple sequential narrative from it all. You can't do that. Here's a great example of how to do it right, though. This is a cladogram of whale evolution by the great science illustrator Carl Buell. Puzzling out the evolutionary history of whales has been one of the phenomenal success stories in paleontology in the last 40 or so years. We've been finding so many fossils, they've been fitting together so beautifully. You might imagine that there's a temptation to stack the fossils up in chronological order and say, for instance, first came Pachycetus, and then came Ambulocetus, and then Dalinistes, and so forth. But that's not how this cladogram works. Look at the branching lines, the pedigree. None of these forms are illustrated as ancestral to any other. They are all part of a hierarchy of change. The tips of a rootstock of the whale population is gradually shifting over time, refining itself to a greater and greater degree of aquatic adaptation, and expressing itself in these distinct and individual forms. At the bottom of the cladogram, you can see the last great split in the whale lineage between the Odontoceti, the toothed whales, and the Mysticeti, or the baleen whales. At the time Carl Zimmer wrote this book, the history of this division was poorly known, and he presented it as a mystery pending resolution, particularly in the evolution of that weird filter feeding specialization, baleen. I'm going to show you a cool fossil, an animal called Coronodon, and how it might fit into the history of filter feeding whales. But don't make the mistake of thinking you can slot it right into a narrow narrative. It's so much more complicated than that. Among modern whales, there are two broad categories. There are the toothed whales, like the dolphin and the orca and the sperm whale, that have jaws with rows of simple, sharp, conical teeth. These animals are raptorial feeders, that is, they charge in to bite and seize individual target prey, like salmon or squid or seals. They have a deep history. A lot of the ancient whale ancestors in the previous diagram were big biters, hunters of large prey. But there's another alternative in the ocean. Huge swarms of tiny krill, small crustaceans that flourish, especially in the upwelling nutrient-rich waters of the Arctic and Antarctic. It would be inefficient for a large animal to snap one by one at tiny little shrimp. Instead, they engulf a whole school of krill at once and expel all the water while sieving out their food on these numerous plates of fibrous material, the baleen. So how did these amazing structures evolve? Can we find, dare I say it, transitional fossils illustrating how it occurred? And I'm going to say yes and illustrate it with this beautiful beast, Coronadon Havensteini. But it's not the naive version of a transitional fossil where we assume Coronadon is an ancestor of modern baleen whales. It almost certainly isn't. 
Uh, what it shows us is that aquatic animals 30 million years ago were adapting in complex ways to employ, exploit this rich food source of krill. Here are the jaws of Coronodon. Notice anything? It's the ornate teeth. Look at those odd bumps and projections and crannies. They aren't for chewing, they're for trapping. They, the top and bottom teeth are also staggered to make a maze for shrimp. The most likely mode for feeding was ram feeding. It would charge into a school of krill, jaws partly open, and the food would get stuck on the snaggly back teeth, and then it could just lick it off. It also had the option of using those pointy front teeth to bite into passing fish if it wanted a bigger, different taste. This is not an unusual strategy. There is an extant animal, the crab eater seal, that has even more elaborate teeth. This is the skull of a crab eater, which, by the way, doesn't actually eat cra crabs. It feeds on krill in the Antarctic. And you can see how those elaborate teeth would act as a filter. Gulp, then squirt the water between your teeth, and the result is a delicious mouthful of crustaceans. The crab eater seal isn't the only beast that does this. So does the leopard seal, which we usually think of as a big, voracious reptorial predator of the seas. One of its prey items happens to be the crab eater seal. But it also has the option to suck in smaller prey and then expel water, trapping the food against its back teeth. You can see this in action in this video. What we're seeing here is an alternative to ram feeding, suction feeding. The point being that there are many ways to modify a whale into a filter feeder, and the fossil record seems to be saying that the whale lineage was exploring many of them at about the same time. Some were building increasingly ornate and complex teeth, like the crab eater seal today, and others were focusing on behavioral and physiological changes, learning to suck in prey, like the leopard seal. Coronodon was on the fancy, frilly, toothwork branch of the family tree. And note that by this diagram, it wasn't on the direct line to modern baleen whales. All of that tooth variation was rendered superfluous by one remarkable innovation in an ancestral whale, the development of baleen. Baleen whales have discarded teeth altogether. They may develop them as small nubs in utero, but they regress and are lost. And instead, the gingiva, or gums, thicken and produce numerous hard but flexible plates of keratin, the same stuff that makes horse hooves, rhinoceros horn, and your fingernails. But animals like Corondodon are still transitional forms, even if their particular lineage was superseded by a different set of whales with a killer adaptation that still exists today. All right then. I'm going to give you some sources to read. So a lot of the information I presented on uh, Coronadon came from this paper by Geisler and others, a recent publication in Current Biology. Uh, but I also have to say you should be looking up some of the other information, like the Hawking paper, which discusses alternatives for the evolution of filter feeding in whales, specifically that suction may have come before these fancy early teeth. And then, of course, you should all be reading Carl Zimmer's At the Water's Edge, Fish with Fingers, Whales with Legs, and How Life Came Ashore But Then Went Back to the Sea. It's an excellent book. They'll give you a great overview of transitional forms and of the evolution of tetrapods and whales. And lastly, let me just credit my network. You should come over to rethoughtblogs.com and take a look at all the cool stuff that we're talking about over there.